Hey guys, welcome back to Daniel's Tech World here on YouTube. My name is Daniel Rosell, and today we're going to be looking at art optical media again. But I'm going to be trying to dive deep today and hopefully get to something like a conclusion on the world of the complicated question, the hot button topic of what the hell is the difference between an M disc and your regular Blu ray? The HTL stuff we talked about that is inorganic as Blu rays originally were. Uh, important to remember that LTH was a divergence along the way of Blu-ray, not the original standard. Um, and verbatim say they only make HTL nowadays. So, look, this is one of those things that like seems obsessively minor, I'm sure, to anyone on the outside or hasn't thought about optical. But if you're going down the optical route and you've sort of decided you want to keep your data this way, yeah, this stuff really matters. Is there a difference, especially if there's a big price difference? Is there really a reason to use the M disc over regular Blu rays? So, what's the controversy here? So, when the M disc came on the scene, um, when it was originally the DVD product, it was kind of billed as this is the best archival grade storage media that's ever been invented and it'll work for 1,000 years. And I do think it's a, an amazing technology, I don't doubt its ingenuity. Um, but the question really is, given that 1,000 years is a huge amount of time, is that really necessary if we can get to something that is good enough? And I would, I would, I would submit that good enough would be, I say, 100 years to put it at its far reach. Right, that's longer than your average human lives. And I've made the point that my philosophy or the one I've developed is that data preservation is never about putting something on one medium forever. It's about moving stuff between the best mediums. And I use the example of digitizing VHS tapes. Maybe you digitize them onto optical. Maybe that optical then went onto the cloud. And that's kind of how it goes. Stuff moves on before ideally it gets rotten through bit rot or it gets or the tech gets deprecated. So and anyway, so the MDisc was it was is a great idea. Um, but the company who made it went bust, verbatim picked up the product line. And so people on when you when you finally when I finally got through this kind of uh, Blu-ray question of HTL versus LTH, you you stop and you say, hang on a minute, if HTL is inorganic, and the whole thing about MDisc is it's inorganic, what is the difference, and why is the MDisc better if the Blu-rays were always inorganic anyway? So. I think to answer that question, we need to kind of have a clear understanding of what exactly regular inorganic is in, in Blu-ray world. And verbatim are very... Details, I said here, details are incredibly... Like one sentence, right? There's literally one sentence I could find. And um, if people can find better resources, I'd be indebted. But my Googling skills have not found a more detailed overview of what is this MABL stuff so that we can know how is it different than MDisc without uh, having skills in microscopic analysis, which I certainly don't have. So MABL is metal ablative recording layer, especially created in organic layer present on the BDR medium that ensures prolonged stability for archival life. And again, if you're if you're confused here, it's very reasonable. I thought the MDisc was supposed to be the prolonged stability for archival life. If this thing does that anyway, what's the point of getting MDisc? Legitimate question, I would say. But what the hell does this mean? What is a inorganic recording layer? It sounds like it's metal. What metal? Is it alloys? If if it's an alloy, what metals are in that alloy? What is what exactly is the material? We, it sounds like it's metal, but it doesn't even say here that it is metal. It's just the name. So... I actually found a great resource that you can easily find by Googling what makes the MDisc rock like. So to give credit to Millenniata, they actually try to explain out. You can't expect anyone to say the exact composition of the disc because that's their trade secret and that's what sets it apart from the competitors. But hey, one page is a lot better than one sentence. So this is what they said, Millenniata said about the MDisc. And they gave some good information and this is a PDF called What Makes the MDisc Rock Like. I think it's kind of a gem. Uh, it was obviously some of their old marketing material that I just find still floating around the internet. Um, but they actually explain. And I'm just going to... Well, let me just step back here for a second. What's rock-like? The phrase rock-like is used to describe the MDisc. 
its data layer, yet the disk is obviously not made of rock. So why is this description appropriate? Is this more than a clever marketing ploy? The answer is yes, much more. The MDisk data layer has several properties comparable to those of common rocks. The composition of the data layer, its morphology, and the changes it undergoes during the data writing process all present intriguing parallels to rock. Rocks are composed of inorganic materials that are typically oxides of metals and metalloids. Common compounds found in rocks include silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, aluminum silicates. I just realized I'm kicking myself. I'm kicking myself. I had drinks last week with a, uh, a guy I have become friendly with who who's a geologist. I could have t- if I had if I had read this I would have totally asked him about this his his opinion on this. Um anyway, next time. So if but if you are a geologist, uh, feel free to chime in. All of these compounds are are solids. Okay, fine. Um a bit more about this. The inorganic data layer, the crucial inorganic data layer. The MDisk data layer has many of the same characteristics as those rocks. It is composed entirely of inorganic materials and compounds including metals and metalloids. It contains several of the materials and compounds common to rocks, including silicon dioxide and carbon. Uh, It is a solid from room temperature to upwards of 500 degrees Celsius, and it is stable in the presence of oxygen, nitrogen, water, and other deleterious chemicals that may be found in ordinary storage environments. So that sounds pretty cool. Does that mean you can, like, put your M-discs in the oven? Um, I don't know. Um, someone, I'm sure someone's done the, the torture testing. So a bit more, and I'm just kind of blowing up uh, paragraphs from this PDF. The M-disc morphology or physical structure also has characteristics analogous to common rocks, including multiple layers of dissimilar materials, like common sedim- sedimentary and some uh, igneous rocks. Bring me, this brings me back to old geography classes. The comparisons even make sense on the microscopic scale when the written M-disc can be described as an aggregate of ordered polycrystalline regions and amorphous or glassy regions. The etched pits in the M-disc that hold the digital data are also like the void structures that can be found in many igneous rocks like pumice or scoria, right? That actually makes sense to me. Like, think of a pumice stone, right? All those little um, kind of kind of little holes in it, right? So that the when we're talking about inorganic, whatever MABL is, it's kind of easier to understand from an MDisc because they at least give you some kind of a mental image of what's in the stuff. So instead of uh, organic dyes, we have a dye and we pit away at that dye, right, with the laser. In, in, in organic, the layer is inorganic and we're pitting into. So just like picture a pumice stone, I'm making microscopic... Um, indents into that, right? And that would be how it would write the data. Etching data in stone. Finally, the inorganic data layer materials undergo physical changes during the write process in the same way that rock materials change under the influence of heat and other geologic processes. When the data layer is irradiated by a focus layer, the intense heat thus generated causes the innermost layers to melt away and to move away from the laser spot, creating a hole in the data layer as previously described. The materials found in rocks would react in a similar way to an intense heat source, melting, flowing, or ablating away. In contrast with the organic dyes used in typical DVD recordable discs. So I think this obviously must have been referring to the DVD and not the Blu-ray, not the Blu-ray format. So this does sound, furthermore, okay, I think enough detail. This does sound terrific, but we're referring to the Blu-ray, the DVD tech. I should have pointed that out at the start. Sorry to get people excited if you thought it was the uh, the Blu-ray. So that's that. Um, so there are other archival Blu-rays on the market, um, just to point out. So if uh, we'll, we'll talk about MABL in a second, but take a look at this. So there's um, if you Google archival BDRs, you will find a couple. I've talked recently about buying... I just bought these the other day from uh, Amazon Japan. And I did so because uh, I looked for archival as a search keyword. And um, I don't think it came up, actually, even though it says it in the product description because it's an image, I guess. So uh, Amazon Japan requires a bit of patience. You, uh, you, c- you might need to translate the stuff from Japanese. But I found this one and I instinctively was drawn towards it because I know that Sony invented the Blu-ray. And um, there was the first one I found that had an archival... Um, a claim on it and the commenters were um, saying it was very good uh, storage media and as I've said before 
uh, the Japanese seem to actually still be into optical media and care about it. So it seemed to seem to have a very good reputation. Uh, but it didn't make any specific claim in terms of the years. But take a look at this. Um, I also came across this one from Pioneer. And this is not just only a disc, the JIS X6257. They want you to use it with a specific burner of theirs. And they say that if you use this disc with this burner, your data should be fine for 100 years. Uh, these are quite expensive. Again, as you can see, I don't believe I've seen these in the West. Um, but these are actually more expensive again than M disc, so this is actually quite pricey stuff. Um, here is the label, right? Um, obviously, this is in Japanese, and I do not read Japanese. Although part of me thinks it would be a, a worthwhile investment of my time now. Um, but if you do read Japanese, let let me know. You can give a better translation than I got. Um, but here is the Google Translate. So this is just machine translation with all the deficiencies in it. But I was, I did spot in the Japanese on the first line here, metal ablative recording layer, MABL. So I said, hang on, is that our friend, the MABL layer from the regular HDL Blu-rays? And this is what it says in Google Translate. So the, the disc adopts a unique metal nitride recording layer, metal ablative recording layer, metal nitride. I don't know what that means, but if you do know, chime in. Um, and it gives the same kind of claims that because it's done using ablation, it's better. Um, and that seems to be it. I mean, there. I'm sorry, the, there is also this technology called defect management that has some kind of fancy error correction, maybe on the hardware level. And that's why they want you to use this disk and this thing together. But the core of the uh, claim here seems to center around our mysterious friend, MABL. So this is how it was presented in the West, if you will, in, in terms of um, just, you know, picked up a news, 100 years, these things, these discs from Pioneer will get you there. Um, and that was from 2023, so not that old this coverage. So it's still considered like, you know, it's still perceived to be something worth writing about, if you will. So Panasonic have exited from the optical media business, uh, but they did a 50-year disc um, they did it with uh, BDDL dual layer. I found this just again, Googling basically. So there's a 50 year disc from Panasonic. Here's one that uh, I don't know what's gone on. I don't know if these are still being made. I did write to them yesterday, but at some point they made this for sure. Delkin devices, archival grade, the 200 year disc. So a 200 year claim. I think that's the biggest, the, the best longevity I've seen outside of the M disk, um, and that was up to 50 gigs. And there's even more if you just, I mean, all I did was type archival Blu-ray disks in Google and I found a few more products. Surprisingly, who would have thunk it? Ritech, not renowned for producing the greatest storage media in the world, actually have a, uh, again, a product seems to be really aimed at the Japanese market, um, but it is 100 gig disks and they're saying 50 years on this. Um, so that is, again, for many people, I would suggest a decent enough claim. You can also get these in spindles and they mentioned that the certified by the archive disc test center, uh, the ISO standard is 16963. I've no idea what this mysterious archive disc test center is. Perhaps that's the next thing of inquiry. Um, none of this is very transparent. This is how, this is how they describe it. A unique inorganic phase change recording material with high sensitivity and high transmissivity, an extremely precise layer stacking technology. And now the mic drop moment. Uh, okay, here we go. Get ready for this one. So guess, guess, guess what's supposed to do one, 100 years? The regular verbatim Blu-rays, the ones I have sitting next to me on my desk. Just the regular ones. Um, they have written here 50 discs with a 100-year archival life. Now, the claims about years are kind of inconsistent. On some listings, verbatim, don't make this this year claim. But they do. This is from Amazon.com, so regular Amazon. So they have that for their main Blu-ray product, MABL 100 years. So what exactly is the M-Disc Blu-ray? What are they claiming for the M-Disc Blu-ray? Um, so, so again, it's a bit kind of imprecise. It was marketed as millenniata a thousand years but they're saying here on the this is pulled from the blue the verbatim website for the blu-ray product 
MDisc Media has a projected lifetime of several hundred years. So the difference now is between 100 for MABL and several hundred for uh, the reduced claim on blue on the Blu-ray. So this is this. These are the conclusions. I draw from this, and I think it's really anyone's open to anyone's interpretation. So the MDisc promises to add a couple of hundred years on top of MABL, that's a Blu-rays. But MABL is now being marketed bearing a 100-year promise. And there's other discs for 100 years, even Ritec have them. Transparency is lacking about MABL. I haven't seen any detailed PDF explaining what is that MABL stuff that seems to be getting these products to uh, good enough and that maybe has been around since the dawn of the Blu-ray, which is actually quite old. So it's kind of strange, actually, that this technology has been in use seemingly since uh, the dawn of HTL Blu-ray, but seems to be there's no real information beyond that one sentence from verbatim. So these are my conclusions. Do as you wish. Um... And um, I think this hopefully shed some light on the MDisc, the unorganic layer and all that stuff. Thank you for listening until the next episode.